So I'm going to talk about flow uh, plus, and if you had told me uh, 15 years ago that I'd be finding flow fascinating, I'd probably have asked you to have your head examined. Uh, but it's actually pretty amazing the kind of stuff that you can do, not just with traffic, but with traffic and other kinds of telemetry that you can get. Performance data, BGP data, URL data, um, and you know, I think a lot of people have seen a lot of what's possible with BGP, but a lot of the big data techniques have really opened it up so that you can actually even have some of the non-network nerds have visibility into the network. So, how many people have heard in the last 30 days, is it a network problem? Okay. Uh, and just for the audience, how many people here have logged into a router or switch in the last 90 days? Okay, so I didn't actually need to put on my lung pants for this audience, that's fine. Um, <laughs> And uh, how many people know how much every, how many people are service providers, infrastructure providers? And how many of you know how much each customer costs you uh, to actually deliver that service? Okay, so that's interesting. Um, and uh, you know, for the, for the enterprise side, it's more of a question of, again, is it the network? Well, what's the application doing? Um, sometimes how much does that application cost, but more about performance. So our, my view is it, the network, is this nerd thing, but there are a tremendous number of companies where their revenue is all packet-based. If you're a web company, if you're a VoIP company, if you're a service provider, if the network doesn't work, then you're not getting revenue. Um, and that traffic data that you can actually get, um, and you know, Modulo, most vendors don't crash anymore if you try to get telemetry out of them uh, much. I wouldn't recommend being the early adopter of streaming network telemetry, but uh, do it in your lab if you'd like to. Um, and that, that can actually answer, get to a lot of questions. And so modern network telemetry isn't just you take some stuff and you store it, and there was a talk about that from the SNET earlier. Um, and it's really, you know, let's look at all the different places we can get data. Um, one of the things you may not think of as flow-like data is actually Nginx logs. Nginx logs are pretty cool. How many people here uh, run a service that uses Nginx somewhere in it that's revenue dependent? Okay, so not that many, so a few. So Nginx, actually in the log, you can have it look into the TCP info struct and tell you what the network layer performance, loss and latency is. That then looks like flow. Okay, it doesn't have TCP flags, but how is that really, that's actually more interesting than maybe NetFlow, SFlow, IP fix. And, can be unified in the same way, and now you've got some performance data. Um, so while I'll talk about this, there's a little bit of a unification and fusion problem, which there are some big data technologies that can help with, but think more broadly, I've got flow, I've got SNMP, I've got maybe some DNS query logs that can be unified. Um, maybe you can actually have a sensor or look in on an agent. Uh, the question I asked earlier, um, uh, about Docker networking instrumentation is because I've seen a lot of people use nProbe and actually turn packet capture on servers into flow that then has, again, application latency, client latency, server app latency that you can use to help answer some of these questions. And if you put all that together, I've got the magic data engine thing there. That's, I'll wave my hands and say, you know, you have that thing. Then there's a lot of different things that you can use for it. Some of them are spelunking. Uh, reactive, I can just find out what's going on. Some of them are proactive, and again, um, you know, uh, again, service providers, there were a bunch of them, uh, things like, who are my highest revenue customers that are starting to migrate to AWS? Maybe that's interesting. Um, uh, again, how many people here sell transit? Some transit providers, okay. So uh, what to many peer people is peering analytics, to some people is, who is it that I'm sending traffic to for free already that should be paying me? Um, and so it's a sales prospecting tool. Um, so a lot of the same technical views can have multiple purposes. So um, a lot of different interesting things that you can actually do to drive technical and business operations, which also, by the way, helps you get budget for toys like instrumenting your infrastructure and understanding it. Because if you can help the rest of the groups, the people that run the applications um, and the people that run the finance side, then it suddenly becomes a lot more interesting. So. What this gets towards is data-driven network operations, which is that you can be guessing less and actually show what the impact of some of these decisions are. Um, and I think of this as network traffic intelligence and 
if you can get the right food, and if you can put it together in the right way, and you can get the right output, it can make a big difference to businesses. And what we actually think is, you know, all the tech nerds should have nice things. Uh, you know, Docker is the cool shiny stuff that the, that the application people get, which lets them ignore the sysadmins. I don't know, what's the cool sysadmin stuff? Uh, not having to deal with anybody, I guess. Um, you know, developing, uh, becoming tools people. And, you know, network folks, um, uh, you know, it's time. Um, but you've got to have, and this again echoes um, uh, the ASNet presentation, you've got to be able to store the data because you don't always know in advance how you want to access it. Even if the system that you're actually querying um, uh, maybe has a subset of it, um, the data is actually very valuable. And correlating and fusing between data types is really important. Um, and um, I'll skip over some of the rest of this. And then, whoops. So again, food. Food. Data is food, especially for data dreamers. So what's the interesting data source? Um, Flow and BGP and SNMP. How many people have something, some system that does SNMP? How many people have uh, MRTG still running? MRTG, anybody? Okay. No one will, okay, one person admitted it. Uh, how many people, most of their SNMP data is in RRD files? Okay, I would expect more. MySQL databases? Big data? Like the ESNet, okay, ESNet. Um, so, uh, you know, how many people have a flow system running that takes some sort of flow? Okay. Um, actually, DNS is an interesting one. A lot of people don't realize the full value of that. There's also some very interesting security aspects of that. Uh, if you want to see what's owned and what's infected, then again, you may not want to see what's owned and what's infected in your network because you might want to have plausible deniability. So, um, but actually much richer, if you can, can take get performance and layer seven info, then you can do a lot more with this data. And again, I mentioned Nginx logs. We'll, we'll talk about what some of those sources of the performance data are. But BGP, uh, which you need to figure out, um, uh, you know, path, peering analytics, customer cost, uh, even communities from BGP can be hugely interesting because many people have geography in, in that data that you can use to, to get out and look at cost. I would say customer metadata, I call it tags here, but it's what customer is it? What application is it? What rack is it? Metadata about this. Don't think if flow, if, if, if flow becomes an important part of how you look at your infrastructure, you should map it to what the business is so you can ask business questions against the data. So the problem is that you do need to do some fusion that a lot of the current tools don't offer right out of the box. Now, PM account, how many people use PM account? So PM account can do BGP unification. I don't think it does DNS. Um, and, you know, uh, Palo is still actively developing it. Um, uh, a lot of people put this all into streaming systems or otherwise do integration. On the business tags, the metadata, that can be a little bit trickier. Because imagine your threat intelligence database, or imagine your, your database of what IP addresses and potentially ports are in use for Docker networking. That can actually be a big table like a BGP routing table that you need to unify with flow. But when you think about a data architecture to be able to store, you do need to do this fusion component. That's the tricky part. Once you do that, though, and you can do geography and AS, again, geography, AS, that's pretty easy. But DNS, business tags, um, those things are a little bit more complex. You get a lot of, of interesting use cases, which I'll talk about. So where can you get this data? Um, sometimes application logs, if they can look at the network layer, which again, Nginx data can. I don't think Varnish, uh, HAProxy, any of that stuff can, but some of the ADC logs, F5, you can get data from there. Uh, and again, you know, in, in my work, I think of flow as a very broad thing that doesn't have to come from routers or switches, because if you can get performance data, it's just hugely more interesting. Uh, how many people are actually taking streaming telemetry, the protobuf, Juniper stuff, the Cisco stuff? So um, streaming telemetry is the vendors listening to us, and we said, foolishly, you guys suck, you don't expose enough data, we want a feed of everything. And they said, well, that's a lot easier than sending you some things, we'll send you everything. And so the OID, the OID unification problem just got a lot harder because you've got every single process fan, route update, whatever, from Juniper and Cisco with different architectures that you need to go grab. From my perspective, I'll start with, I just want queue depth. If I can get queue depth, that's an approximation for congestion. I can put that on every flow. It's better than nothing. Um, as, how many people know Matt Levine? 
Matt Levine from Cashfly Server Central. So I asked him about a solution. He said, it's pretty much horrible, but better than nothing. So that's my view of some of this stuff, is you gotta, you gotta make incremental process, uh, progress. So um, streaming telemetry has the promise of giving you some interesting data, um, you know, BGP path data, event log data, again, to be overlaid. You know that there was an issue, maybe you should overlay that so you can actually see before you go deep debugging something, you know, was it the butt crack with the keys that, you know, sparked something that actually caused the problem? Uh, stop looking at the software configs. So where can you get this, this, this augmented kind of data? How many people have optical taps in their network anywhere? Okay, how many people have sensors attached to those taps that can run PCAP aware applications? Okay, so from those you can run NProbe, which is not quite open source. Um, um, there's Argus, which is open source, but is a little harder to use. Um, you can actually do things that watch PCAP at, you know, $2,000 computer, 10 gig line rate, um, and send you data, send you a flow record, and IPFIX has lots of room to templates to stick additional info in with, again, application latency, client latency, and towards the server, you know, you, towards the user latency, towards the server latency. If you have those three things and you can slice and dice, you got a lot of power. Um, you can hook up commercial sensors. Actually, how many people have Gigamon boxes? So Gigamons today can, that was like a, yeah, yeah, we have some of those. Uh, they are pretty expensive. Um, so they can actually generate flow. Now, the biggest problem is they don't sample all that well. So it means that you're gonna send, you know, four million flows per second into your little, you know, VM running uh, PM account. That's not gonna work. But um, they've done layer seven, so you can actually get flow with certificate name if it's encrypted or HTTP headers. And as a customer, ask them for what we've been pounding them on, which is to do some of that latency grab information. How many people run Bro somewhere in their enterprise? Uh, so Bro, what's the difference? I mean, that's a flow data. Again, it doesn't have TCP, but it has layer seven. Right? If you have things that talk about transactions that happen, they can be very flow-like and very powerful when you put that together with BGP and other data. Um, and then Cisco AVC, I've been disappointed uh, in you know, Cisco Juniper because their packet sampling, they only support packet sampling, not flow sampling. Even the Juniper flow switched stuff, the SRX, still when you do flow or SFlow, it's only packet sampled. And you actually need to sample on, an on everything or nothing in an entire flow if you want to start tracking TCP latency. And so there are some chipsets that will give you performance out of your infrastructure, but they're typically lower end stuff than this audience might use. You could do it on CPE maybe if you've got uh, some of the light, low end Cisco stuff as NetFlow Lite, and then there's some interesting stuff that you can do, but on the core routers, not so much. So what can you do if you have all this magic data and you can magically, you know, have your wizards fuse it together, then um, there's a few interesting use cases that we'll run through. So network planning, um, and a lot of these use cases, again, I'm gonna talk briefly, are both for network nerds and for the business side, which again, if you can help the business side, then you'll get more budget on the network side, which is always a good thing. So if you take flow and BGP, um, that's you know very typical top talker, why is my pipe congested? Um, that's a very common use case. But also really strategically, and peering, and we can have a whole debate about this, is more for control and performance nowadays, most people that I see than for cost. And it's who should I be connecting to so that when my CEO complains that she can't get to somewhere else, I can have the food, I have the ability to make a routing change. Um, and also cost evaluation. How many people have been, had to make a decision in the last year about where to pop their network for exchanging traffic? So like how do you do that? Um, what's the data that feeds that? So um, if you actually take, and I apologize a little small, um, flow plus BGP, then you can actually start to see hop by AS hop, where's my traffic going? And the two big use cases for that are, this is a little small, maybe you see, anyone know, know pop quiz, what AS is 4436? Anyone a customer? Okay. Um, so maybe I've got a lot of traffic to 3320 through 4436, sorry GTT, maybe I'd rather take that off. Or maybe that was a peer, for example, maybe that's someone I should go try to sell to because if you're a carrier, you'd like to collect money from everyone possible multiple times, more than two times if possible. Um, but same thing, if you can actually augment this with customer data, now you could s select in on a customer and say, what's that customer doing on top of my network? And then maybe if you have BGP communities data and other things, how much does that actually cost me? 
Another thing which, which you can do but when adding BGP, which just with a flow record can be a little hard, is where did the traffic actually go? So generally flow is ingest only. With S-flow, you can get outbound side, but with NetFlow and IP fix is generally ingest only. Um, and with a little bit of tagging, as I mentioned, maybe you say these prefixes or these communities are, you know, Miami or are this customer or this application. Now you can actually start to slice and dice the flow by uh, what it is. Now, this diagram looks nice and fancy. It's really just a SQL select statement against a big data backend that is saying group by ingress interface, which that you, is just in there. It's just unified with SNMP data. Ingress pop, which in this case is one of those tagged metadata fields that you need to do at ingest, but then that could be, like you could augment in JSON, stick it in a column store, and then it's a column. Egress pop, same thing, and then dest AS is something that you already have. Uh, maybe you override what the router sends or not. So this is really just a select A comma B comma C comma D, but present it in what's called a Sankey diagram, which is just D3 and there's some code for it. Now suddenly you start to see how traffic's flowing across your network. Um, another thing that is actually really interesting is anomaly detection just does, doesn't have to just be for DDoS. How many people have some sort of DDoS detection system other than, oh shit, stuff's down, let me look at what's going on? Okay, so one. Um, but it actually can be for performance and it actually also can be for peering and it actually can be both in the positive and negative direction. So this is more of a thought tease because we don't, in a half hour, I, I can't talk about all the options for how to implement all this. But I will also say, Seeing, and again, like I mentioned, is your big customer migrating to AWS, or is my biggest customer stopped ordering from me if you're enterprise, um, can be very interesting. Um, not just who's new, but who isn't there that used to be there. Um, for CDNs, how many people run Anycast anywhere in their infrastructure? Anycast, anybody? So uh, this kind of analytics can also be very interesting in terms of what new countries are popping up, and I only have five minutes, so I will pass, go past that. Um, as I mentioned, customer cost analytics, if you can actually program customer, which again you might have in BGP community, then you can actually say just for one customer, what does that, what, what's the use? Uh, if you can program racks, you know, into prefixes, you could start to look at um, devices and you know, a data center map. Because one of the magical things about self-driving networks is um, they usually, or, or really I'd say SDN with the definition of SDN is for applications. Application controller stuff generally puts stuff all over your infrastructure with no understanding of what's connected to what. And you often have point congestion that you need to be able to get at and say, again, for the, what's causing this? What are the top applications that are using this ingest port, this uplink port? Um, and then, again, fusing the business data lets you do some interesting things. This is an example of someone who actually is programming in customer IDs and just without selecting, just says, okay, show me the top end customers and what parts of my infrastructure they're using. Um, and again, if you want to implement this, it's just another thing at the fusion layer, like you would fuse BGP, and whether it's BGP communities or per prefix, you just add a column if you're, if you're um, ingesting into a database. Some things like Silk don't let you do this, but if you're just taking JSON into Kafka and then ingesting, you're just adding columns, and then it can be something that you can search on. And again, this is just really a SQL query underneath that just gets presented. Um, and then, do we have any revenue enhancement officers in the room? I guess I'm CEO of a company, so we're sort of on the sales side. Um, so I mentioned a couple of those things, it, which, is, uh, which is how to identify customers. So the last thing, um, second to last thing, network performance analytics, um, is where is the problem? And I'm fortunate enough to be able to work with dozens of web companies where they actually really want to share information between the development, the networking side and the application side. Like they really don't want to blame the network if it isn't, and the network people really want to show if it is a problem so that, so that you know, things can get resolved and they don't have to get woken up. Um, and if you can get that kind of augmented performance data, then looking at application latency, um, and again, looking at it across your infrastructure, if it's just a column that you have in your store, or looking at packet loss and then being able to look at the before and the after, um, whether it's by prefix or ASN or customer. Uh, and then the big riddle that I haven't yet figured out is how do you make this actionable to people that don't know what a network is that think it's all magic? So that's something we're, that I'm still working on. But 
Um, at least if you have the data, it can be APIable. Someone can open a ticket. It can go get data um, that indicates it. I think that can be very powerful. Um, I'm going to skip over and just say, you don't probably want to replace Splunk with your flow tools, but when you see things that are correlated to network issues, it can be very powerful to see, is there a DNS error? Is there an HTTP error? And again, if you already have a tap or you can put software on, on at least some servers, you don't have to instrument every server. You can have 30 servers that do 40 gigabits and have two servers in the load balancing pool that do 100 megabits and at least you have some data. Feed that in. Now you've got a view of what other people are seeing. The last thing, application level attacks um, from DNS, you can see you know, just an awful lot of crap of all sort, but some of it is compromised machines, botnets, things like that. Um, fast flux domains, it can be very interesting for your security group, it can also be very interesting when you want to track down Akamai who has an AS, but has a lot of traffic that's distributed from ASs all over the place. So I think the slides are up, uh, and I should save 30 seconds for questions, and of course the remote access trace. So there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can look at uh, in the DNS domain also that I would say can be interesting to network operations. So takeaways, Lots of kinds of traffic, lots of interest. The more you fuse it together, the more interesting it is. Again, echoing the, 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 this, the first presentation this morning. Um, and I would say not just data you can see, but data you have about what it means to your business. Add that in and you'll get even more budget to play with all your fancy toys uh, because more people will be able to get understanding and help them do their jobs. Um, so a lot of work, well worth it. Any questions? Did I stun you all? Okay. Flow nerds unite. Hey. Oh, question. So you have all this data that's aggregated into uh, essentially a central place where you can run queries and stuff against it. Have you thought at all about forming actions based on mm -hmm. like automated actions out from that yeah. data? Yes, uh, I'm not allowed to be vendor specific, so I'll just say in the general category of things, I would say um, there's roughly three kinds of actions. One of them is, of course, DDoS, which a lot of people do. There's, there's a bunch of things. And how many people use FlowSpec in their infrastructure, like support, you know, internally? So FlowSpec is one way, uh, but then some v detection tools integrate with like Radware, A10, Arbors is all integrated, but they are effectively doing that. Um, although it's not a big data store. Second is, um, second is performance based. So any, any old timers were customers of Sockeye, NetVM, uh, NetVMG or Route Science? Any current Noxion customers? Um, so there's, there are actually companies that do this, not from the flow analytics perspective to start, but they'll do changing route maps or changing prefixes based on it. Um, there's uh, Pandora actually, um, programs the, they have older, uh, they were modern at the time, Aristas, um, and uh, do fib compression and actually look at top, and, and I think Netflix does the same thing. So you don't have to buy expensive routers. Uh, so there's a lot of different kind of pushback you can do. So, thanks. Sure. So I've got one other question. Uh, yes. Great talk, thank you. Um, You're welcome. Uh, so this is more of a policy question, which is always kind of an annoying topic, but so having all this data and something I've thought about since I'm trying to collect a lot of raw data, what are your thoughts about sort of data retention and like uh, discoverability? Is this like, are you, are you gonna get yourself in a place where legal's going to say, no, you can't do this because there's way too much room for discovery here, or those kinds of mm -hmm. things. You heard anything like that? So um, uh, again, try not to be too vendor specific. I would say that it really depends on, it's up to ultimately the customer to set the policy. So, you know, if you're a SaaS provider, it's, it's, you should implement retention or provable deletion um, at the level of customer. In Europe, um, IP addresses are PII, personally identifiable information. And yes, I have a slash 24 at home and an AS, and you could see from Flow whether I'm home or not. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, I don't think that's an issue. I think if you get into sensor and performance stuff, I don't think it's an issue. I think if you start actually listening to what I was talking about and doing layer seven, then it gets a lot trickier where you might, you need both access controls but also retention. And so I would say, um, uh, like most SaaS providers implement that kind of separation and separate expiration policy 
uh, and then on DIY, it can get a little trickier. Like Elastic is what we see most people who are doing their own using, and it doesn't even, it, does, ne it neither has a retention model a, 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 uh, for discovery and stuff like that, nor a security model. Anyone that can connect to it can get it to anything, mm -hmm. which we see a lot of big carriers in a big enterprise where the security group does not want the application owner to be able to see everything that's happening to the desktops, which they might have some switches. So you might actually have different users which only should have access to their application or the public internet infrastructure and not the CEO's you know, switch port. So that's another interesting thing to think about. Yep. If you're at the backbone level, it's, it's less of an issue, and if it's just IP addresses, then if you're just in the US, it's probably less of an issue. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of our hedge, right, is we're, we're, yeah. we're connecting together a bunch of sites, we're not at the yeah. site level. And we have a random number generator in the White House, so who knows, but um, <laughs> you know, we'll see what happens. Okay, thank you very much.